Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wendy Cromash. Thank you for joining us. We are in for a very interesting, timely presentation uh, by Dr. Wendy Perlman, uh, who is a professor at Northwestern. Uh, let me just thank the Levy Senior Center Foundation for uh, setting up, providing the funds and the organization, organizational structure and support for us to host these Levy lectures. And uh, we thank you for tuning in. I know it's a beautiful sunny day, but um, this will stretch your brain and be good for you. So let me introduce Dr. Perlman. Um, she is, hang on one second, okay. She is a professor of political science at Northwestern University, where she also holds the Charles Deering McCormick Professorship of Teaching Excellence. She's a specialist in comparative politics of the Middle East, and she's the author of four books. She um, has written, uh, in addition to the four books, she's written dozens of articles, essays, book chapters. She earned her PhD from Harvard University an MA from George Washington, from Georgetown University, and a bachelor's from Brown University. She has conducted research in Spain, Germany, Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza Strip. She works incredibly hard, and she's very talented, and we are very lucky to have her here. Wendy, uh, you're still muted. Muted, ah, perfect, okay. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you and I will see you at the back end for the Q&A. Great. And everyone can hear me okay? Yes. Or at least you can, Wendy? Yes. Wonderful. Um, yes. Great. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, and as Wendy said, for taking some time out of your day to, to learn about Syria. Um, I'm thrilled to, to talk with you today about my book, We Crossed a Bridge and It Trembled, Voices from Syria, um, which was published in 2017 and put it in the larger context of the Syrian conflict. I know it can be confusing. We've been hearing for many years now about the Syrian war uh, in headlines, about ISIS, about refugees, about bombing, about chemical weapons. It can be overwhelming and difficult to understand how this conflict began, what it's all about, who is fighting whom, and I hope that this lecture today will help um, uh, you make sense of some of those complexities and give you the, the tools and power you need to, to follow the news um, with confidence and with empathy and attention to the human dimension about what all of this means for, for real, real men, women, and children um, in Syria and now around the world. Um, so the context then for that is the interviews that I have been doing with Syrian refugees uh, for about nine years now. Uh, a bit of backstory is that I, I study Middle East politics, as Wendy mentioned. Um, I began studying during a college semester abroad in Morocco and got hooked. And when the Arab uprisings began, um, the Arab Spring, as some call it, I really wanted to know what those protests were like and what drove people to go out into the streets and decided to interview Syrians about their experience of the Syrian uprising. I began in Jordan in 2012, essentially talking to every person I could meet, starting with a few names, and then they, they snowballed and one person led me to another. I returned to Jordan, then moved on to Turkey, to Lebanon, as the large number of uh, refugees and migrants reached Europe in 2015. I began doing interviews with Syrian refugees in Europe as well. I've done some interviews uh, right here in Chicago and in, um, in the US. And starting in 2020, I've begun doing interviews over Zoom. So the project continues. I'm now working on a second book, a follow-up to the book about which I'll be talking to you today. Uh, these interviews have been open-ended. I usually ask people, tell me something about yourself and just follow wherever they want to go. The interviews have varied from short 30 minute conversations to uh, oral histories that last sometimes four or five hours, sometimes extend over days or, or even years. Uh, I have tried to, as much as possible, talk to people of different ages, genders, uh, socioeconomic classes, regions, religions, and so forth. But there's a major caveat that most people um, I've met, um, which I believe represents the majority of refugees, although certainly not all, um, 
are opposed to the regime of uh, Bashar al-Assad. They are people who largely identified with, supported um, in, to, at least to some degree, perhaps even participated in the uprising that began in 2011 and remain opposed to the current Syrian government. That's the kind of revolutionary perspective that I will, um, I will present to you today. It doesn't represent all Syrians, but I think represents a very large slice of the Syrian population and one that meets with too few opportunities to represent itself. So I've collected and collected these oral histories, these life stories and reflections of hundreds of people. And then over the years, slowly transcribed them, translated them, analyzed them, and put together this book, um, which is a curation of excerpts of the testimonials arranged in a chronological order to walk a reader through the story of Syria exclusively through the voices of Syrians themselves. So my job was to read the interviews, cut parts, put them together in a kind of mosaic that could walk a reader through this story, beginning with what reflections were like um, about Syria well before the 2011 Arab Spring, through how the revolution began, how it escalated, how it became a war, how ultimately uh, these displaced people come, came to flee their homelands. So what I'd like to share with you today is a sort of microcosm of that book that will walk you through that history and share some of the voices um, that you'll encounter in the book if you have a chance to, to pick it up. So let me begin where the book begins, and that is stories of authoritarianism. So in 1970, General Hafez al-Assad seized power in Syria um, after years and decades of coups and instability uh, and established a strong authoritarian regime. Uh, he won some degree of popularity, especially through economic policies of redistribution of, of wealth and subsidies and services and so forth, um, but allowed no space for criticism. Uh, there was a threat of violence uh, or use of violence for anyone that would dare to criticize this uh, single party authoritarian state. So the stories that I gathered about this era of Syrian politics until the year 2000 um, emphasized how this authoritarianism became a part of people's everyday lives, how a single ruling political party, an omnipresent security apparatus, a pervasive network of covert informants, all policed society and encouraged society to police itself. Let me share with you some words about what that was like for Syrians. Um, here are the words of Ilias, uh, a dentist who I interviewed, who said, Syria had the appearance of being a stable country, but in my opinion, it wasn't real stability. Nobody trusted anyone else. People would say, don't talk, the walls have ears. It's a regime based on command and obedience. Every state institution recreated the same kind of power. The president had absolute power in the country. The principal of a school had absolute power in the school. And at the same time, the principal is terrified. Of whom? Of the janitor sweeping the floor because they're all government informants. Here, Ilias's words give you a sense of the everyday reckoning with this threat of violence that stood behind the status quo. There were times in which that became not only a threat, but a real lived reality. And the picture you have here is from the town of Hama, um, which is uh, an incident in the um, early 1980s when the Muslim Brotherhood, which had at that time was the most organized opposition group after a, a lot of back and forth um, violence and, and challenges between the regime and the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood launched something of an armed insurrection in this town of Hama. The Assad regime sent in tanks and troops and helicopters and planes 
and flattened entire parts of uh, the town of Hama and killed an unknown number of people, up to 40,000, some say, including civilians who had nothing to do with the Brotherhood or anything else. And this is a, uh, it's hard to uh, overstate the importance of this incident in Syrian history of, in many ways, scaring an entire generation into the sense of that this is what the regime would be willing to do to those who, who dared to challenge it, uh, creating that kind of silence thereafter that Ilias discusses. Let me give you a, another, uh, another voice to tell you to what degree the sense of silence, of the walls have ears, it's better not to talk, became such a part of Syrians' lives, their sense of self, it could even stay with them after they left the country. It was so internalized. Let me share with you um, the words of, of another, uh, another Syrian man I interviewed who said this, and he left Syria as a child and was recalling other Syrians who might travel in the 80s or the 90s um, and encountering them abroad. And he said, when you meet somebody coming out of Syria for the first time, you start to hear the same sentences. Everything is okay. Syria is a great country. The economy is doing great. It'll take him like six months, up to a year, to become a normal human being, to say what he thinks, what he feels. After all that time, even outside Syria, you feel that someone is recording, as captured here in the, the political cartoonist, of the, the, the Syrian cartoonist Ali Farzad. So Hafez al-Assad ruled into the year 2000 um, when he died, his son Bashar became the president. Syrians always like to remind us that the Syrian constitution at the time said that the president had to be at least 40 years of age. The single party dominated parliament quickly met upon Hafez's death and amended the constitution to allow 34 year old Bashar to assume the presidency. And when he did, many believed that this young, uh, educated head of state would make change. And he presented himself as a modernizer and a reformer. Um, and there was uh, a change, not in the security realm, there remained uh, punishment for anyone who dared to criticize, but in the economic realm under Bashar, there was a gradual shift in the nature of the, of the economy from a more state dominated, even socialist leading economy to a more free market um, neoliberal economy. And in many ways, this allowed space for a whole new class of crony capitalists with ties to the regime who became filthy rich while others saw their, uh, their uh, livelihoods only decline. And this created also new spaces for the question of corruption. Now, corruption and co-optation, uh, rewarding those uh, invested in the regime and perhaps punishing or marginalizing those um, not so participatory um, was always a part of the, of the system. But in this new shift in the economy allowed, allowed space for corruption to grow even worse. Let me share with you the words of, of uh, a Syrian young man named Iham. This is his recollections as a child in Syria. He said, even as an innocent child, you could see that the whole system just reeked. It fed on corruption and grew. If you want to get a passport, you have to bribe this guy and that guy. From when you're little, you're taught that this is the only way to survive in this country. As an active member of the ruling party, you're going to get better grades, better chances for better schools or jobs. Everything is handled by how loyal you are to the regime. So you're raised on the principle that you have to show your loyalty. So for most people I met, most of the time there was a sense that this is what Syria was all about. Corruption and repression simply limited the horizons of possibility. To hope for change was foolish. It was simply never going to happen. To actually work for change, whether through politics or protest, was simply reckless. It would only get you and probably even your family in the worst kinds of trouble, most represented by political imprisonment, which most people knew to be synonymous with being tortured 
being disappeared, never being seen again. So as, as expressed by uh, one Syrian whose words are the opening to the book, a Syrian citizen is just a number. Dreaming is not allowed. And that I think is what 2011 and the Syrian uprising and the Arab Spring means and continues to mean for so many Syrians. It was daring to dream in spite of it all. So the book uses a series of anecdotes and memories and reflections to show how this massive revolt got off the ground, how Syrians first followed the news of Arab uprisings in other countries, in Tunisia and Egypt, began to debate with themselves, will it happen here, maybe yes, maybe no, how there were, there were a few tentative demonstrations that got off the ground and were repressed, a few demonstrations that got off the ground and expanded, were met with repression, the first people were killed at the hands of the police forces, and demonstrations spread. They spread over space, one city and town after another. They were sustained over time, one week after another, bringing larger and larger crowds out into the streets. We are now at the point where it is precisely now the 10th anniversary of the Syrian uprising, and there are lots of, of fascinating reflections and memories about the mechanics of how an uprising happened against all odds, and I'd be very happy to talk about that sequence of events. But here I'd like to focus a bit on the human dimension and what protest meant for those Syrians who participated in it. And I think that is best captured in an expression that became ubiquitous throughout Syria and really throughout the Arab world at this time, which was the barrier of fear broke. And what comes through in people's stories about the barrier of fear breaking is that fear, fear of the real reality that you could be imprisoned or killed if you went out in protest, never disappeared. The people mustered the courage to go out and protest anyway, to do what they believed in to, uh, to fight for a better, a better world and a better Syria. Let me share you some uh, stories about what this breaking of the barrier of fear means and what protests meant and the revolution meant. Here the first words are from Shireen, uh, a mother, um, and this is what she recalled. She said, oppression was residing in us. It was part of our life, like air, sun, water. We didn't even feel it. Like air is there, and you never ask, where is the air? But then in one second, one shout, one voice, you blow it up. Don't even imagine that it was easy to go out to a demonstration. No amount of courage allows you to just stand there and watch someone who has a gun and is about to kill you. But still, this incredible oppression made us go out. I encouraged my nieces and nephews to come with me to demonstrations. I felt that if they didn't try that experience, they'd be missing the real meaning of life. When you chant, you shudder and your body rises and everything you imagined just comes out. Tears come down, tears of joy, because I broke the barrier. I am not afraid. I am a free being. Sadness and happiness and fear and courage, they're all mixed together in that voice and it comes out strong. Before the revolution, Syria was just the place where I lived, but it didn't belong to me. When the revolution began, I discovered that Syria was my country. Nearly everyone with whom I talked about the experience of going out in protest said it was an experience that was not simply emotional, but was transformative. I would ask people to describe their first demonstration. And what people would usually tell me is, la tusif, it's simply indescribable. And I would say, I'm writing a book. Can you try to describe it for me? Can you try to put it into words? And people would say things like, it was the first time I breathed, the first time I felt like a human, the first time I felt like a citizen. One man said, it was better than my wedding day. 
And when my wife heard that, she refused to speak to me for a month. This sense that it was like the first time is for me best captured in words uh, from an interview with Rima, a writer, and this is what she said. She said, I was in a demonstration and I started to whisper, freedom. And then I started to hear myself repeating, freedom, freedom, freedom. And then I started shouting, freedom. And I thought, this is the first time I have ever heard my own voice. And I told myself that I would never let anyone steal my voice again. This, I think, is what the Syrian uprising meant and means uh, to the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions who found their own voice, voice through it. But as we know, the Syrian story uh, did not end there. So as the voices of my book go through and talk about these different experiences through the different stages of the Syrian conflict, the next stages are that of militarization and war. Uh, protests uh, became large, it remained overwhelmingly peaceful for some three, four, five months. Um, into the summer of 2011, the Assad regime responded to protests with various forms of violence from beatings to torture, imprisonment, rape as a weapon of war, house searches and so forth. And eventually those in the opposition also took up arms. I talked to some who became fighters and rebels in this war and they explained why. And typical are the, the words of, of one young fighter who went by the name Captain, who put it in these terms. He said, when demonstrations began, the security forces came. We agreed that if they were going to shoot bullets, then we needed weapons too, because of the blood. Blood is the force of the revolution. So as various um, armed rebel groups uh, formed um, uh, in a fragmented way at the neighborhood and local level, uh, the regime escalated its reprisals, eventually using uh, tanks, artillery, missiles, uh, uh, rockets, uh, aerial bombardment, barrel bombs that were bombs, uh, uh, barrels literally, or, or dumpsters, uh, stuffed with explosives that could collapse entire buildings, chemical weapons, and so forth. Uh, various state and non-state actors became involved, either supporting the opposition or defending the Assad regime. And the conflict escalated into a multi-dimensional war, the complicated war that has gone through various ups and downs and continued even until today. And here I will, I will um, break uh, well, not break quite yet, um, uh, break a, a bit to tell you not so much about the war itself, but the civilian experience of what it is like to live war. And here I find in the various stories that I've collected and that appear in the book, almost two contradictory experiences. On the one hand, war is terror. People describe crouching with their families, hearing the planes overhead, just not knowing when they would bomb, where they would bomb, if they would make it through the, the, the night. Um, the, the scenes of war and what people have witnessed is a trauma uh, and there's no other word for it. On the other hand, there's a kind of normalization to terror and trauma. People get used to it when this is the backdrop of their lives and they can't leave and this is uh, the reality they're forced to leave. So, so there's so much I think to say about how people become normalized to be a civilian in war. Here are just a couple of voices to give you uh, a little sense. One aspect is um, the degree to which war, uh, in some people's uh, way of putting it, um, left them unable to be shocked. Shock became so normal, there was no shock anything more. They became kind of immune. Here, let me share the words of a man from, from Idlib province in, in the, the northwest of Syria, who said, at first, one or two people were killed, then 20. Then it became normal. If we lost 50 people, we'd say, thank God, it's only 50. It's been so long since that I heard that someone died of natural causes. 
another aspect in which we can see this um, kind of normalization to the terror of war is in humor. And I think there's still a lot to be said about the role of, of humor, of satire, creativity and art in general of how Syrians have coped with, with the horrors that they've endured. And to give you just some sense of the humor here, not from an interview I did, but um, a post that one of my interviewees put on Facebook one day in which he wrote, the most important and beautiful thing about the revolution is that people rid themselves of the words, hush, the walls have ears. To which one of his friends commented in another post, yeah, that's true, but there are no more walls left. Anyway, everything's gone. Um, the next sort of stage of following this journey from authoritarianism to revolution to militarization and war is that of displacement. Um, as uh, the Syrian war became engulfing and life horrific and threats at every corner, those Syrians who were able to leave and get out did and became an increasingly um, sort of exiled uh, population. So to give you some sense of, of that, uh, more than half of the population of Syria, uh, before the war around 22 million people, more than half the population has been forcibly displaced, has been forced to flee their, their homes. This, um, uh, this map is a little bit outdated, but gives you a, a basic sense. Most of the numbers are, are surprisingly uh, still current now. So, all of these are estimates, but it's estimated that about 6.8 million Syrians are internally displaced. So they've been forced to flee their homes, but they still remain inside Syria. They might be um, living in, uh, in camps for the internally displaced. They might be um, renting apartments, living with family members. They are also considered uh, refugees, but internal refugees. Um, some 5.6 million Syrians are refugees in the Middle East. As you can see, the largest number, something like 3.6 million, are living in Turkey, uh, nearly 1 million in Lebanon, where that makes Syrian refugees uh, something like one in four people in the country is a Syrian refugee, um, uh, something almost 700,000 or so in, in Jordan, smaller numbers in Egypt, in Iraq, in Sudan, moving into into North Africa. In the, these countries on Syria's borders, um, they uh, typically do not recognize uh, the 1951 Refugee Convention that recognizes basic refugee rights. So they do not have status as refugees, which, which guarantees certain legal rights. Instead, they're regarded by the government as guests, as people who temporarily fled, um, which means they don't have basic legal guarantees, typically are not able to work in the legal, formal economic market, instead work informally, meaning they typically work for lower wages, um, worse conditions, lower pay, and without uh, any real type of job security since they're working in, informally or, or legally. There's large problems of child labor and children not in school, of uh, indignified housing, um, all the kinds of crises that you can imagine. Some are, are, some are doing okay, um, but a lot are living in such tremendous precarity that um, there's some new waves of people going back to Syria, not because it's safe, not even perhaps because they want to, but they can no longer kind of cope with the harshness of life in what we often refer to as the border countries. Um, some 1 million Syrians have made it to, to Europe. Um, uh, as we know, the sort of large waves of, of, of boats in 2015, when many people crossed the Mediterranean from Turkey to Greece, and then walked through the Balkans, um, often with the destination of being uh, Germany or, or Scandinavia, North or Western Europe. Um, and some have been able to then bring their families with, with family reunification programs. So there's something like 1 million Syrians now making new lives for themselves. Um, many who now have children who speak local languages better than they speak Arabic, um, the creating of a, of a new diaspora. Um, 
all of that put it sit into context the extremely low numbers of Syrian refugees uh, since 2011 who have been um, accepted into the United States. Before 2011, the term Syrian refugee didn't even exist. There really weren't Syrian refugees. Uh, as we know, uh, during the, the Trump administration, there were severe cuts to the refugee resettlement program in the United States in general, something like only about 21,000 Syrians um, fleeing Syrian war have been resettled in the United States. So you can take a second to absorb um, the, the very, that very, very small number, especially um, in proportion to, to the rest of the world as you, as you see it. So given that um, all the people I've, re I've interviewed have been refugees, um, it essentially has been too dangerous for me to go inside Syria and talk to Syrians. And for the most part, even to, to speak with, 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 with Syrians remotely um, uh, inside Syria, I've talked to, to refugees. So there's so much I can say about the experience of being a refugee and people's hopes and their dreams and their disappointments and their struggles. Uh, there's some of that in, in the book. A lot of it is what I'm going for forward now um, in the second book I'm, I'm, I'm writing. Um, but let me give you some taste of this displaced uh, experience for now. And I'll share with you just a short excerpt, um, which is, I think, um, speaks to a much larger themes that I hear again and again, talking to people about their refugee experience. So here are the words of, of a mother I met in Berlin, Germany describing how after she and her husband and two young children took the boat over, made it to Greece, and then began their process of walking. So she said, in Greece, we started walking. My husband carried our son the entire three-week journey. I held our daughter by the hand. Everyone along the way tried to make profits at our expense. Days were flaming hot and nights as cold as ice. My feet bled. All I wanted to do was sleep. Every step we took, we found ourselves longing for the steps that we had just taken. Once, after I got here to Germany, I met a journalist. She told me, the most important thing is that now you're safe. I told her, but we haven't come looking for safety. We are not afraid of death. And it's true. We don't have a problem with death. Our problem is life without dignity. This word dignity has come up in so many ways and so many uh, times in the interviews I've done. And I think is one of the most important themes about what people saw themselves as fighting for in 2011 and what money now struggle for in a very different way uh, in lives uh, as refugees or asylum seekers. So the final uh, portion of the book is titled Reflections. After going through this long chronological journey of the story of the Syrian conflict, phase by phase, step by step, uh, this last part is a series of passages in which people sort of look back and make sense of, of what they have endured and who they have become in the process of, this, of these changes. And people uh, often express very pained reflections. Um, these range from a sense of anger against what many feel is the uh, indifference of the rest of the world and international community to what they've suffered and the failure of the world to do more to stop atrocities in Syria, uh, to a sense of nostalgia from a Syria that many now say simply no longer exists the towns they grew up in no longer exist. The people that made it home are no longer there. To a sense of sort of existential in instability, not knowing what the future holds, either for Syria as a country or for them and their families individually. To, in spite of it all, hope. As many Syrians tell me again and again, Syrians are living on, on hope. And still others uh, express lessons and changes about who they have become in the course of all this and what it means. So I'd like to have the last voice I share with you then be from a woman who I met in, in uh, Turkey um, several years ago. I know that she's now uh, gotten asylum in, in France. And here are her reflections on what all of this means. And she said, we were living under dictatorship for 40 years. And we were tired, tired of hypocrisy, 
tired of only getting a job if you have connections. We wanted to know this famous thing called freedom. But now, if you sit with 1,000 Syrians, they'll each give you their own sense of freedom. For me, freedom is living in a society that respects me. Freedom is being able to express myself. Freedom is the chance to do something for which people will remember me. When I got to Turkey, I sat home for the first year. My mental state was rock bottom. I'd started working or had worked for a few months in radio. Then a job opened at a major TV network. 10 other people applied for it. They all had degrees in journalism. I didn't, but I wanted the job. For three months, I practiced how to speak before the camera. I'd stand in front of the mirror and talk to myself. I'd record my voice and say words this way, that way, to figure out how to make them sound better. Then I did an interview with the manager. She told me that she didn't want to hire me, but that I had a kind of talent that not all journalists have. She said, Talia, I wish you weren't this good. And just like that, I got stuck in her head and I got the job. I discovered that I'm a person who can have an impact on others. It was the revolution that taught me to be impactful in this way. And it was the revolution that allowed me to see people for who they really are. It showed me that every Syrian has a hundred stories in his heart. Every Syrian is himself a story. And I have certainly found that in interviewing Syrians, every Syrian is a story. This book will introduce you to some of those stories um, as well as the collective story that they, that they, that they, they uh, come together to tell. So um, to move then uh, to some more current issues in Syria and how all this rel relates to what we might be seeing in the headlines today. Um, one is this question of has Assad won? If you look at the shape of the, the map, you can see that whole swaths of the country fell from um, the control of the government in the course of the years, 2012, 2013, 2014. The course of the war has been the struggle of the Syrian government under the Assad regime to take back that territory that slipped from its control. And that is what it has achieved through brutal military means over the years, that part, this part, such that the majority of the, the territory that was lost by the Assad regime is now back under its control. As we know, large parts of that, that territory fell under um, what came to be known as the Islamic State um, through US-led bombing campaigns, as well as forces on, on the ground. The Islamic State collapsed as a territorial entity. So the country remains fragmented, but militarily, the Assad regime has increasingly um, beaten back the military challenges to it and reestablished its control. So has the Assad regime won? Um, and if it has won, in some degree, the war is increasingly over, is it safe for refugees to return? These are some major policy issues and, and, uh, and, and, and political questions that you might see in debates about Syria today. And it's complicated militarily, perhaps. But here are just some articles from the New York Times in the past years. You can see how complex. What has Assad won? What is he govern over? This, uh, this headline from in the, in the bottom right-hand corner says, yes, victory, but at what price? The country is shattered infrastructurally um, in terms of, of entire neighborhoods and towns and buildings still crushed. And as you see here in the bottom left, there's a new crisis in the past year, uh, hyper, hyper inflation. The Syrian conflict uh, or the Syrian um, currency is now a fraction of its value. There are acute shortages in food, in medicine, in fuel, in electricity. So economically, the country is in shambles. And this is what the Assad regime sort of rules over. But to get to the second question, if the war is basically over, what does this mean for refugees? Well, right now, as we speak, there is some um, 
a, a major sort of new initiative that, that the country of Denmark um, has, is the first uh, of the U European Union to say that um, areas under the Assad regime are now safe, essentially the war is over and, um, and has begun to uh, um, withdraw the residency permits of some Syrians uh, refugees who've made it to Denmark. So there are about a hundred or so people who have been told that they uh, essentially might be forced back to Syria. And um, this is really in the headlines now. I'm seeing these pictures of, of Syrian um, kids who finished high school in Denmark and learned Danish and have integrated and are now being told they might have to be returned. Families are even potentially going to be split up. Um, this is, is very scary. And I think a harbinger of, of an issue that we can continue to keep our eyes on um, as, as perhaps other countries that have absorbed large numbers of refugees say, um, the war is over, you can go home. Is it safe? Uh, no, there have been dozens or even hundreds of cases of Syrian refugees who have returned and have been disappeared, have been arrested, have um, been detained, and nobody knows anything about, about their whereabouts. Given that the regime remains what it is, uh, its ability to use force at, against its own citizens at whim, now combined with the kind of security and economic crisis of a situation um, of, of tremendous precarity and people desperate to survive and perhaps even willing to, to kidnap or to, to use violence against their neighbors um, because people are literally starving. But the regime remains the overwhelming threat. And just one image to remind us of that is, is this case of a, um, a Syrian American who left Syria as a child, spent his entire life in the US, uh, became a, a psychologist, uh, living, li living in Arkansas, returned to Syria in 2017 to visit family and uh, was, was arrested and has not been since from, heard from since. So his American family has been desperate for the past four years to try to get some sort of attention about his case, but nothing is known. And there are tens and thousands of, of Syrians who've been arrested and detained and their families don't, don't know about their, their whereabouts. So has Assad won? It depends on your point of view uh, and what exactly he's winning. Is it safe for refugees to return? There I would say uh, unequivocally no. So the situation looks uh, sort of pretty bleak, huh? <laughs> to go back to this. Um, but I want to leave you with some, some sources of what I see as, as hope and, and space for change and even um, excitement about what may be the foreword for, for Syria's future. So here is, is one picture. Anybody have any ideas about where this picture might be taken? A slice of Syrian life? You can guess where this might be, a restaurant called the Danacene and so forth. Uh, it's in Berlin, Germany, and I spent three summers right around the corner from this restaurant in, in a heart of, of, of the Arab uh, neighborhood of, of Berlin. So I think that one thing that is very exciting that a lot of Syrians talk about is the, is the potential of this new diaspora. Um, it is, of course, very alarming what Denmark is doing about the thought of perhaps forcing some refugees to return, but some 6.6 million Syrians who've now making their lives in various points, ports of the world. Uh, many are, are now situated to, to have a multi-generational diaspora. What was yesterday's refugee crisis is tomorrow's diaspora. People are learning languages, they're learning new skills, they're establishing themselves. Um, I've talked to people who are now working as, as, as doctors, um, as artists, as, uh, you know, as thriving students. Uh, there is a question, can there be some source to continue this struggle to for a free Syria, to build a free Syrian consciousness or movement from abroad, even if it's uh, the, the prospects for doing so within Syria are increasingly constricted. So keeping your eye forward on Syria, I keep thinking about um, what a new diaspora might mean for a long term struggle uh, for, for freedom and dignity for Syrians. Along with this new diasporic potential, um, people, of course, investing in themselves and gaining new skills and new talents and new capabilities and new resources. There's also a really thriving sort of thriving sort of civil society and associational life. So this gives you just some of the, the slogans of, of various civil society groups, volunteer initiatives, human rights organizations. Um, 
schooling initiatives, whether it's uh, you have here an Arabic language bookshop in, in Nether the Netherlands and the bottom corner is a, an innovative education program with, with houses for, for Syrian youth in various places in Turkey. Um, there's a lot I think here to continue building the capacity um, and the future of this, of this diasporic nation. Another issue to keep your eye on um, that is something that, that many Syrians ha have been quite meaningful for them is this question of will there ever be some sort of transitional justice? Um, uh, over 500,000 people have been killed in Syria, some tens of thousands missing, uh, many more injured and, and as we know displaced. Will anyone ever be held accountability for what the United Nations and other associations have called crimes against humanity and war crimes. Well, there is the beginning of some of some work on this in in Germany recently. If any of you have been following this case in the past year, there were two uh, Syrian officials uh, who are both working in Syrian prisons. Their job was essentially to torture and uh, starve uh, Syrians who were imprisoned, usually not on any charge at all or because they were accused of some sort of nonviolent participation in, in dissent. They came to Germany as refugees and applied for asylum along with all of the other uh, hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees. So we're making their lives and actually living in a refugee shelter in Berlin and other Syrians recognized them and said these two were officials in the prison and some even said this these were the guys who tortured me or ordered my torture. So they were arrested by the German government and there has been over the last several months, a very public high profile trial of these two Syrian uh, officials um, on crimes of torture and crimes against humanity. Um, one was uh, just sentenced to about four and a half years of prison um, and the other, the bigger fish of these two fishes, uh, it's, it's still waiting what his, what his sentence will be. But this has been very meaningful for many Syrians knowing these are relatively small fish in the big scheme of the Syrian regime, but it has been one space in which um, the world has been told. It's been a public reckoning, a documentation, um, an investigation and judges objectively verifying that the, um, the crimes that have committed have really been committed and there's an overwhelming amount of evidence. Other Syrians have been gathering documentation about these types of crimes. Another famous case, and this is in the top right hand corner, you have this picture of this woman seeing photographs. This refers to what is known as the Caesar case. Caesar is the name of, a, of another Syrian official who worked in the Syrian prison system. And essentially his job was to take photographs of of corpses and, and um, those who had been killed in the prison. And there's a sort of meticulous kind of documentation with numbers and, and names and so forth. And while he was doing this job in the prison system, he was secretly copying tens of thousands of images on a USB that he then smuggled out of the country. Uh, some over 50,000 images. Uh, that he smuggled out um, and this became public in 2014. These images have been studied thoroughly by forensic scientists. This um, defector who goes by the name Caesar has testified before Congress. The photographs have been um, shown on the floor of the United Nations. Uh, if you just Google it, you'll get more stories than you can ever imagine about, about Caesar. That is just the tip of the iceberg of other sorts of documents that have been smuggled out of Syria, internal documents that demonstrate um, and document and verify the kinds of crimes who have been committed. So it is still early in the struggle for transitional justice or accountability, um, but it is one one space um, in which many Syrians remain active and which there might be continued uh, movement in the years to come. And in that realm, also here in the lower left-hand corner is a picture of, of women who part of an organization called Families uh, uh, for the Detained or Families for Freedom, in which it's, it's mostly a women-led organization, mostly mothers and sisters and wives of, of Syrian men who've been detained and uh, 
they don't know if they're alive or dead. They haven't been heard from since, and they are very active. Many, um, all refugees now outside the country, uh, they had, one of their activities was to create this red bus um, plastered with the photographs of those who've been disappeared and, and drive it to many different European capitals to try to raise awareness and, and keep alive this demand for justice, demand for the release of these disappeared individuals, or at the very least, um, information um, so that they don't live every day with the uncertainty, not even knowing if they're their um, loved ones or alive or dead. So the Syrian, the Syrian issue continues, even as it falls off a little bit on the headlines uh, as we get them here in, in the United States. So I want to end then with this one um, return to the word dignity. We had the, the, the mother talking about her being uh, a refugee saying, oh, someone's saying, oh, well, you're at least you're safe. And she's saying, we haven't come seeking safety. We have come um, seeking dignity. Uh, and one way that has been very sort of dramatized, um, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie For Sama. It's an absolutely amazing Syrian documentary film. I work on this every day and I still watch this and was reduced to tears. Um, so if you watch it, bring a lot of Kleenex, but it is an absolutely uh, unlike anything else I've ever seen or read or heard on Syria, the film for Sama. It's available free to stream on, on PBS. And it was nominated for an Academy Award in 2020. And the director, this woman, Wa'ad al-Khatib, wore um, as her dress to the Academy Awards, a dress embroidered with this theme, the slogan, we dared to dream and we will not regret dignity. And now 10 years, celebrating the 10 year anniversary of the Syrian uprising, many Syrians have taken up this slogan as what, where they stand after 10 years. Uh, we dared to dream and we will, not, we will not regret dignity. So just to wrap up, why, why do we do all this? Or leave, why do I all do with this? Some things I wanna leave you with about the importance of listening to Syrian voices. One is that it puts current events in context. I began talking about, we hear about Syria and ISIS and refugees and weapons and attacks. It can be very easy to see these as events, as numbers, as blips in and out of the news cycle. Hearing people's stories and voices help us remember the human dimension and what is at stake for real people's lives and, and always hold on to that as the grounding of the Syrian story. Um, there are debates about what the US could have done or should have done or what any country uh, or government should do in the policy realm about Syria. There are not easy choices. I have my own opinions and you might all as well. Whatever our policy stances, I think that hearing voices and stories help us infuse those political opinions with empathy. Again, never losing sight of the real people involved. There are not as many Syrian refugees in Chicagoland as I, as I wish there were, but there are, there are some. We have new, new neighbors of Syrian refugees as well. And knowing their stories is a way to help um, welcome them as neighbors and, and, um, uh, and understand all that they carry with them and that they carry with them into this process of, of integrating. And for me, most importantly, the sort of bottom line is uh, it's important to listen because it has taken so much courage for people to get to the point where they can speak. And I hope what you've seen today is just the glimmer of some of this journey, this painful journey, this uh, courageous journey, uh, of Syrians to be able to tell their own stories, the very least that we can do is listen. So thank you so much for your attention and happy to, to open up the rest of our time for questions. Wow. Okay. Uh, let me stop the share. Okay. Or I can, want me to, to Yes, please. Great. Oops. That was really a lot to think about. Yeah. Um, the book is very, uh, 
it's, you know, it, it goes through the, the stages, the five stages that you described. Um, and some of the stories were just heart wrenching. Um, unbelievably sad, some unbelievably cruel. Um, and yet there were funny parts. I'm glad you read um, the quote from the guy who said it was the best night of the <laughs> better than I laughed out loud when I read that. Um, really, really wonderful. Um, I have Thank some you. questions, but let me get to some of the readers questions. Great. Um, Sid would like to know, what is the role of Russia in Syria now? Has Russia taken their fair share of refugees? Um, just putting also into, into chat, because I saw one person wanting the, the link to For Sama. So thank you for that. And I hope you can all, all, all watch the, the, the film. It's absolutely extraordinary. So the role of, of Russia has been um, one of the chief backers of the Assad regime. So the Assad regime uh, arguably would have fallen had it not met with political, economic, and military backing. And its chief allies and supporters have been Iran, uh, Hezbollah, the Lebanese uh, group that is allied with and supported by Iran. Um, Iran and Hezbollah have both had fighters and advisors on the ground fighting along with the Assad regime against Syrians and Russia. Russia's role has been uh, twofold or more than twofold, but key, a few key roles is one, it has vetoed in the United Nations Security Council uh, uh, resolutions that might have authorized a greater role for humanitarian aid for, for, for Syrians or some sort of political involvement. So Russia's literally vetoed resolutions um, that prevent UN humanitarians for getting aid into Syria in, in areas that are under regime bombardment and siege or so forth. So it has been a crucial ally uh, for the regime uh, in that sense, um, economically to help the regime shore up its, um, its coffers. And then crucially, Russia became involved militarily. Um, starting in fall 2015, the Russian Air Force began essentially bombing alongside on behalf of the Assad regime. And whatever are the strengths of the Syrian army and its Air Force, the uh, capacity of the Russian Air Force is many, many times that. So I have talked to Syrians who said, you know, we endured many years of, of Assad regime bombing. But when, this, when the Russians got involved, there was just you know, the quaking sound in the skies and the ferocity of the bombing um, from this you know, first world quality air force was, was unlike anything. And there were many Syrians who, some said that that's basically when they, when they gave up and many who had held on, that's when they finally fled was when Russia became involved. So Russia became involved at a point in which things could have tipped in the, in the, and um, the regime might have fallen, um, but, uh, but Russia essentially has, has saved the Assad regime and gets a lot of credit for the fact that it's still there. So in that context, Russia has not accepted any Syrian refugees as far as I know. The, while there are certainly those who support the regime among the refugee population, all surveys and estimates uh, predict that the larger number of refugees are people opposed to the regime. And this is for a few reasons. They are people who fear persecution. I myself have talked to guys who said they fled the country because they knew they were going to be arrested or they were arrested and they got out of prison and they left before they could be rearrested. So they're people who, or they were wanted and knew they were wanted by the regime. So some people leave because they, are fleeing persecution from the government, or they have fled in areas that have been um, under siege by the government and fled because they were under bombardment, meaning that they're from areas and neighborhoods and towns and cities that tended to be more with the uprising. So while the rebels took up arms, it's really crucial to remember that only the Assad regime and its allies bombed from above. They have exclusive use of the skies. So even ISIS carried out horrific events and, and crimes on the ground, but the worst damage has been done in terms of destruction to people and destruction to communities and threat has been bombing uh, from above aerial bombardment. So many have left 
an aerial bombardment, meaning that they tend to be from areas that um, where the re rebellion was strong and the regime was in sieging. So, and that the, given that most of the refugees are against the regime, and Russia's job has been to uphold the regime, Russia has not um, accepted any refugees, as as far as I know, and as I said, is actively blocking humanitarian assistance to them. Um, are Russia and Syria the only countries that have gone from the air? Yeah. That, they're, that, that um, well, no, well, have bombed sort of rebel held areas and the rebellion. The other, when the US, as we know, has not gotten involved in, um, on, on part of, well, the US <coughs> did not want to militarily become involved. And we can get to this whole question of the 2013 chemical weapons and the red line and the Obama administration and so forth. When the US became most militarily involved in Syria, it was in leading the coalition against ISIS. And that began after ISIS declared the Islamic State in parts of, of Syria and also parts of Iraq, uh, declared that there was this entity called the Islamic State and was carrying out all these horrific atrocities as we know, including beheadings and so forth. The US and many other countries joined a coalition to bomb, um, to bomb the Islamic State. So the US became very, US and other countries became very heavily involved in bombing Syria, but they were not bombing the Assad regime. They were not bombing other um, territories that were involved in the rebellion, they were specifically targeting and trying to crush and destroy ISIS. So there have been other countries bombing, but and this is uh, the complicated, um, the complicated uh, question that, that the fact that there are many different wars. There's the war between the Assad and its opposition. There's the war between ISIS and the world coalition opposing ISIS. And now there's also increasingly a Kurdish Turkish uh, conflict also happening inside Syria's borders just to make things more complicated. Does ISIS, uh, is ISIS for or against the Assad regime? So um, ISIS, but well, one is that ISIS is increasingly defeated. So ISIS remains as an idea. There are some ISIS fighters underground, but ISIS at, at where it peaked in 2014 has largely been, been destroyed. So I wouldn't say, wouldn't rule out ISIS um, completely, but it's 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 really uh, on on sort of the um, the uh, yeah. the defensive, yeah. So um, the the uprising began against the Assad regime, and then within that opposition struggle emerged many different groups that had their own agendas. Um, Al Qaeda came in to the Syrian rebellion from Al Qaeda that had been based in Iraq, came in and saw within the Syrian opposition, its space to create and pursue its own agenda, which is to create an Islamic state. Um, and they carved out a space within the Syrian opposition. Targeting again, the Assad regime, also opposed to the Assad regime, but having a different goal than the secular nationalists, people who just wanted a less repressive society that went out in the first place. ISIS then essentially emerged from from uh, Al Qaeda. And in theory, it was against the Assad regime. But if you look at the target of ISIS attacks, they seem to have really been motivated by only one thing, which was to conquer territory, to hold on to territory for itself, and declare that an Islamic state. So they weren't actually very actively fighting regime forces. Um, they were wherever they could taking some, some territory and they created their own their own entity. So I wouldn't. It's in theory they're against the Assad regime, but in in um, in practice they've been more for their own selves and have also done a lot of um, carried out force against against rebels themselves because they're more um, have been carving out, taking sort of exploiting opportunistically the chaos for their own advantage. Um, did you interview any Assyrian Christians within Syria and? How has that population fared over the past 10 years? Yeah, so see, even some of the voices I shared with you today were, were Christian and, um, and others were other minorities. And, um, and there was a voice in there that was Kurdish and some that and most that were Arab. So it, the interesting thing is that they're almost indistinguishable. You know, you it would be hard to guess who of the people, I, voices you just heard were, were Christian or, or not. So yes, I've interviewed many Christians or, or Druze, which is another, uh, another religious minority, um, as well as, as Kurds who are ethnically 
ethnically, culturally, uh, uh, an ethnic group apart from from the Arab majority, um, and the the there's a the, the question issue of sect and religious difference is very complicated in in Syria. The Assad regime is from a religious minority group called Alawite, which is a kind of offshoot of of, Syri of religious of, of uh, Shi'i Islam, and um, the Assad regime because it was avowedly secular and nationalist. The, the ideology of the Ba'ath party was um, not religious, was sort of uh, Arab nationalist from its very, and the fact that the family itself was from a um, religious minority background has historically presented itself as the protector of other religious minorities. So the majority of citizens um, in Syria are Sunni Muslim, um, but the Assad regime has always presented itself as we are specially protect religious minorities to make sure they have full rights and dignity and standing in Syria. So when the uprising began and um, the majority of its backers um, were like the population, Sunni Muslim, um, and especially this Alawite community um, benefited in many ways from the Assad regime that put its own family members and people from its own community in positions of power and protected them, again, opportunistically, thinking that they were, were loyalists um, and loyalists because of that, that kin uh, uh, religious tie. Um, early on, it presented a sort of rhetoric that basically said to, to Syrians, um, this is a Muslim fundamentalist rebellion that is seeking to create divisions, that is seeking to destroy Syria's secular national way of life and replace it with an Islamic state. And essentially they will come out and kill all of you or destroy your standing religious minorities. So it actively tried to work to have, to keep all minorities, including the Syrian Christian minority with the regime, which led to a situation in which disproportionately minorities stuck with the regime not necessarily because they liked this regime, in many ways had the same criticisms, but were made to be quite afraid by the opposition. And many made the calculation that the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know and, um, and who can afford to take risks. So that led to a situation which disproportionately Syrian Christians have been supportive of the regime more than, than Syrian uh, Sunni Muslims. That said, there are people on all sides. There are Sunni Muslims who stuck with the regime. There are Christians who've, who've um, risked their lives and, and, and gone to prison for the uprising. And, um, and all of those exceptions and complexities ex exist. So in the, vo in the book, you'll hear various voices of, of Christian Syrians. Wow. Uh, <laughs> can you talk a little bit um, going back to the history of the Assad family and, uh, you know, the current ruler, um, Bashar, yeah. was trained as a doctor in London. Yeah. And it, it always surprises me to hear that he is so ruthlessly brutal toward his own people, and yet he was trained to be a healer and it, it's like it doesn't um i mean i know mengele was a doctor also so it, it's probably similar but it's just so pitiful and um he, he's destroying his country and he's destroying his population and i just what is what is he getting out of it? <laughs> it's it's a, it's a it's a fascinating question about a sort of you know what goes on in the inside the minds of of of, of essentially dictators or war criminals and and I mean I think that there are various sort of psychological mechanisms. One is is um, ha, is this dehumanization of the other, that when people carry out, and maybe this is a study of, of genocides and massacres and other types of crimes that people commit crimes, are able to commit these types of crimes against another when they cease to see them as, as human and cease to see them as humans like them. So I think that there is a process of dehumanization, not only at the upper ranks of the, the regime like Assad himself, but of all the people, all the lower down who are, who are actually um, 
committing these these uh, committing these crimes and including the torture in prison when which it's one person face to face with with another and can hear the screams and see the pain. So I think there's a process of dehumanization and I mean a kind of of delusion that um, that Assad is convinced that I mean the rhetoric that Assad has used and he's made many many public interviews um, and speeches is um, that he it is he what he is doing is necessary to save the country that this began as a peaceful uprising and evolved into a rebellion um, our terrorists our foreign conspiracies our um, foreign interests that are seeking to undermine Syria's sovereignty. So there is a, um, a, a kind of convincing about the regime and its supporters um, that what they're doing is, is, is right and is necessary. Um, there's another uh, interesting uh, dynamic, which is not only those who are the regime and support the regime, or those who are against the regime, but there's a really important middle ground that Syrians sometimes called the gray people or the people in the middle who are sort of on the fence that weren't necessarily big supporters of the regime, didn't go out in support of the uprising, but were sort of waiting to see which way the winds would blow. They wanted to stay, be on the, on the winning side and they didn't want to risk the consequences of being on the losing side. Um, the price was simply, the costs were simply too high. And there was a lot of doubt and confusion, lots of different information, different stories, people, contradictory ideas, any event you'd hear a million different questions about what happens. There's some people, whatever the regime would do, the regime would deny it and have a different, um, a different point of view. This comes even to today that some people ask and wonder, did the chemical weapons attack of 2013 even happen and things of that sort. You know, the Assad regime said, well, the rebels staged this and, and chemical weapon themselves to make it look, look bad for the regime. So there's also um, so much disinformation that some people can kind of justify withdrawing um, because they say, well, we simply can't really even know what's what's happening. So it's it's a complex portrait, but people can convince themselves of all sorts of things, I think is, is one final and lesson. Is there any instability or unrest in the army that, um, that he's using to harm their own people? So, so yeah, so, um, and this is the, the role of armies vis-a-vis -vis the government has been a really important issue throughout the Arab Spring country. So we know in Tunisia and in Egypt, for example, when people went out to protest the authoritarian president, the president who had been there for 30 years, um, the army ultimately sided, uh, the, the army ultimately was side with the people because it's a little complicated, but the army ultimately told the president, you need to step down. Um, there's a break between the army and the regime, which led to the head of state stepping down in Egypt and Tunisia. In Syria, you can think of the army and the regime sort of as one. And this has been in this, I see one of the, the questions about, um, or so the, the early history of, of the Assad regime, Hafez al-Assad was himself a general, came to, came to power through a military coup d'etat and put his most loyal, loyal, loyalist trusted confidants in the highest positions in the security apparatus, the army and the security forces. So it formed alliances with all sorts of different groups to get enough buy-in, but in the most sensitive positions, those that would ultimately use violence against the citizenry were real loyalists. So this created a situation in Syria in which the top brass, the leadership of the army is basically one and the same with the regime, that they sink together or they, they you know, swim together because they are the same system and the same vested interests. Um, but it, is, it has been a, uh, a conscript army, meaning that every Syrian young man has obligatory mandatory army service. That means that the lower ranks, soldiers, foot soldiers, when, they, uh, when the conflict began, looked like the population itself. And there were many young men who were just simply doing their obligatory army service. Um, and then we're called upon to fire at protesters, but they actually supported the protests. It was them, it was their brothers, it was their cousins. They just happened to have had the bad luck to be doing their military service at this time. So there were a series of defections um, that tended to be lower ranking defections. Those soldiers who could escaped, but even that was, was quite, quite dangerous because if your officer knew that you were about to take off, um, you would be, uh, 
imprisoned or, or, or killed. Um, so, so I talked to many army defectors who made very elaborate schemes about how they got out of, of the army, um, sometimes even as elaborate as, as faking their own kidnapping to just pretending they went on family leave and never returning. So there were various defections, but it was not enough to, um, to unsettle the structure of the army and the, the structure of the army and its leadership has, uh, has remained in the service of upholding and defending the, the political status quo. Yeah, it's... Uh... Does Assad have children? Because he inherited his role. So I'm assuming that that is still in place. Is he grooming? His, his children are quite young, I believe. You know, I'm not, not sure their, their age, but they are, they're still young. Young, yeah. So yeah. Teenagers. what would happen to him? What would happen to, what would his success, who would his successor be? Um, I don't know. His, his, his own children are too young to assume the presidency. So uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what, what would, you know, who would, um, if it's his, his brother, who's, his brother is, a, um, is one of the top military commanders. So it might be his, his brother might be next in line or, you know, it's not a monarchy. This is the interesting thing about, about Syria and other authoritarian presidencies in the Middle East is these are in theory republics, they're constitutions, it's, you know, it's not a monarchy where the king uh, uh, is supposed to give the presidency um, to his, his child. There is, you know, there are in theory elections, although they're, they're complete farces and, and Assad wins, you know, by 99% of the vote or so forth. So I'm not sure what the plan is, is next. I think the, the hope is that he, 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 um, he survives. For the near future, at least. Yeah. Um, there's a question here, has Israel helped the Syrian refugees? Which is an interesting question from a humanitarian standpoint. Yeah. Um, yeah. After Israel was created in 1948, the Jews of all the Arab countries were basically forced to leave and, you know, expelled. And, um, I mean, I know a lot of Syrian Jews who they lived, there was a very rich culture um, in Aleppo and other places. And, and it was beautiful at one point in time. Um, so what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's a, a great question. I mean, there has, um, Israel has not um, accepted, clearly the relationship between Israel and Syria is very, is very fraught. There are not diplomatic relations. Um, there, there is have a history of, of wars. Um, all, I think nearly every Syrian I've ever talked to is is um, extremely critical of the of the state of Israel. So I don't think many Syrian refugees would. Uh, there's it's Israel would might be afraid of the security concerns of of of, of, of Syrian refugees. Syrian refugees, most of them are opposed to the very existence of Israel. So it's a complicated thing. And so as far as I know, Syria um, or Israel has not had any Syrian refugees relocate into Israel. Israel has um, carried out. Um, you know, has been involved with, I think, some degree of, of humanitarian, humanitarian aid, especially to, uh, to southern Syria on, on Israel's border, but it's, um, it's been fairly limited given um, the, all of the political complexities involved, um, not only on, on the Israeli end, but really on, on, on the Syrian end, where there would be, you know, maybe a taboo even of accepting um, aid, for, aid from Israel. So it's a very complicated Absolutely. complicated fraud question but it's a terrific it's a terrific one because Israel is a part of of the region and this is on its border too um so it's uh, it's it's complicated in all the ways uh that of the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict is, is complicated um are the other I know Iraq supports Syria you mentioned that uh or it was mentioned or Iran yeah Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I mean, Iraq too. Iraq is a little complicated because it's in some ways Iraq is is under Iran's um, fold, but Iran has been the, the super big important. Uh, the, the yeah. The other countries, um, Kuwait, uh, United Arab Republic, uh, Morocco, um, Qatar, 
uh, are they backing Assad? No, so Assad's real backers are essentially Iran, Russia, um, Hezbollah as, as, as a group, and Iraq to a smaller, a smaller degree, but that's reflective of Iran's influence over Iraq more than, uh, more than much else. Um, the other countries of the Arab world have been largely either um, uh, supportive of the uprising and the opposition to Assad, um, or not really much involved. So in the beginning, um, the Arab countries of the Arab Gulf, like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Qatar, had various degrees of support to the opposition and to the rebellion. Um, and uh, the and Turkey has been um, perhaps even a stronger, more stronger, uh, stronger backer of of the Syrian opposition, um, as was the United States that called um, that said as early as August two thousand eleven that Assad was illegitimate and should step down. And the European Union and other countries had a similar stance that, that Assad is essentially a brutal dictator and it should no longer be in power. The problem is that the, the countries in support of the opposition have not been coordinated and cohesive amongst themselves. They often are competing against themselves. So Saudi Arabia might support one rebel group and Qatar another rebel group because they were actually in comp competing with each other or competing vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. Um, and the US basically did not really wanna get dragged into a, a Middle East war. So we were supportive, but very strategically and in a limited way with the, with the goal of not, of not getting dragged into a quagmire. So the countries have been involved, but in a, in a much more limited way in a way that ultimately at a fragmented uh, international allies involved with a fragmented rebellion um, against a very cohesive regime, cohesively backed by strong allies and uh, part of the reason why the, the opposition has been largely defeated. Has there been any discussion of um, at some point trying Assad for crimes against humanity because of the um, the chemical attacks. Yeah, the chemical attacks and um, aerial bombardment of civilians and torture and so forth. I mean, there's very little doubt. And some of you may have seen that there was a story on 60 Minutes just a matter of months ago about the case against Assad. And you have um, legions of human rights lawyers and now um, entire warehouses of evidence. And many say that the evidence against Assad and the Assad regime is even you know, stronger than, than exists in the, in the Nuremberg trials. So there is, uh, the evidence is very, very strong. The question is, how do you get this guy to the International Criminal Court and put him up to, to in prison? That it's, um, you know, how do you, how do you get your hands on him to put him in trial? So, um, uh, you know, he, he remains president in a country whose sovereignty is still recognized by the international community. Um, so that people would need to, you know, physically. And that's, for example, things like, you know, uh, Pinochet from Chile was in London for, for health services when he was uh, arrested in, in London. So were uh, any uh, regimes of re officials of the Assad regime to travel abroad, um, I believe that there would be uh, able to arrange warrants for them to be arrested. But, um, and now they of course are also facing various degrees of, of sanctions. And there was a question about, about the Caesar Act, which is um, US sanctions targeting the Assad, uh, As Assad, his wife and other key regime officials. So they're under economic sanctions. Were they ever to leave the country, they would absolutely risk arrest. But, um, it, but that, that can't really happen as long as they're inside the country. You know, unless there's a some staged sure. commando rage to to so get them. What is Russia getting out of this relationship? Because um, it's not like you know all the Syrians are going to start speaking Russian. Um, is it oil reserves? Is it just a foothold in that part of the world? Other things. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's it's, it's something. It's uh, I see it as, as as the main interest is is geostrategic. That the U.S. used to dominate the, the Middle East. It was our sphere of, of of influence. And as the U.S. has more with withdrawn and um, you know had the, a kind of a, a mandate from the American people of not wanting to get more involved in Middle Eastern wars, there has left a, a vacuum, and Syria has became. Uh, 
a, a vacuum and Russia has, um, has risen its stature as a major player in the region as perhaps the major superpower now in, 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 in Syria and this heart of all of its extensions to various parts of the region um, and has, so it's a part of its own geopolitical, I think, quest for superpower status, um, as well as, as, as fighting what it sees as a Western regime change agenda that Russia sees the US and US imperialism as going around and um, overthrowing any regimes it doesn't like, whether that's in Iraq or Libya or so forth. And Russia sees that as US imperialism. So it is in part wanted to uphold the um, Assad regime against what it sees as US backed Western imperialism to overthrow a sovereign country. And Russia's own, you know, Putin's own authoritarianism doesn't like the agenda of, of Western governments under some ruse of democracy overthrowing dictatorships. So it is sort of allied with a, with a regime that it's an, it has an affinity to, um, to uh, essentially defeat the US, to raise in stature in the entire region. There's also a, you know, a, a Russian uh, naval base and so forth off Syria, but I don't think any of the material, uh, and, and perhaps hope that once the Syrian conflict ends and there's a process of rebuilding that there might be economic opportunities for investment and so forth. And there are already Russian businessmen who are getting in on the ground to you know, buy up these destroyed neighborhoods to rebuild them as fancy hotels and things. So there might be some, some entrepreneurial interests, but I think it, the big thing is, is um, the sort of the geopolitics of in the post-Soviet era, Russia staking out its claim as being a major player that can um, stare down the US and the US will back down and Russia looks stronger. With all of the economic problems that Syria has now, are they in a position to afford all the rebuilding that is necessary? No, and so thank you very much for that, that question. It is another major issue to keep everyone's eye out on is, is the question of economic, um, essentially economic rebuilding, rebuilding and reconstruction. Um, if the Assad regime at this point cannot keep electricity on. It cannot get the, the most basic of, of um, oxygen to COVID patients who are dying at unknown rates. Um, it is an abs it, it, there is a crisis of, of, of fuel that people didn't have fuel in, in their heaters to keep warm in the, in the winter. The country is an absolute economic shambles. So it will look to other countries to foot the bill. And here's when many think, well, well, the Assad regime, where who, who can afford to pay it? Uh, Russia and Iran cannot um, to finance reconstruction. Will the Assad regime look to the UN, to the World Bank, to the IMF, to the EU, to the United States? And that becomes a question. Will we, should we take part in any sort of reconstruction of Syria? On the one hand, there are, you know, still 10, 10 million plus Syrians in the country who are, who are, who are, you know, who are suffering, 15 million or so people who are suffering and need to get on with their lives um, and need reconstruction to do it. On the other hand, is that essentially legitimizing the Assad regime, treating the Assad regime like a partner and um, forgetting all the crimes that the regime has been committed and said, okay, the war is over now, let's help you rebuild and help you strengthen your political hold on the country. Um, and you use that reconstruction for whatever corruption and abuses that the regime will inevitably use it for. So there's gonna be a real question about who will be involved in reconstruction and on what terms and who will be the winners and the losers of reconstruction and what that will mean for the Assad regime only tightening its grip um, on power and being re-invited um, uh, into the world, international community as a, as a legitimate head of state. So that's a, it's a big question to keep your eye on going forward. Are there food, are there food shortages? Uh, yes, I mean, there, I, uh, well, the, I'm not sure to the degree that there are food shortages or um, food is expensive and people can't afford to buy it. So there is, there's hunger, there's hunger, but I'm not sure if it's because there's nothing on the shelves or um, your average person's currency now is valueless and they can't buy it anymore, which is interesting. It's the same issue in, in Yemen, for example, where there's mass starvation, but it's more of a question of people not being able to afford food than um, food not being available. What I'm thinking of is yeah. if, if at some point they can't feed the army, 
that's an opportunity for the, the rebel forces because the armies really, why are they loyal? Because they're getting paid and they're getting fed. Well, I mean, I think that the army again is some of some of the the, the top leadership is loyal. No, I'm yeah. about the bottom, the bottom levels. I think at the bottom is there because they're. I think many in the bottom are there because they're against and they're against their will. I mean, there are just roundups of people of of um at this point, the soldiers like literally getting onto to buses or walking into um coffee shops or on on on, on the person on the street and just saying, "Time to do your military service." So, um, so uh, I think that many of many that are there that are are afraid that they would be they have they have have no choice they'd be killed if they tried to leave or or and of course many many oh, there's also an interesting thing when you look at refugee numbers um, uh, many of the refugees are disproportionately young men um, and that's because they fled their military service they knew that if they stayed in the country they were going to be. Um, recruited into the army and they took off. So I am, um, it's a terrific question, Wendy. I, I think it's an open question about how loyal the army really is um, or they just don't wanna get themselves in trouble or get their families in trouble, so they. Right, because that yeah. was one thing you mentioned where yeah. Yeah. when people escaped, if they fled their military, like there was one person uh -huh. who was working as kind of a spot who was um, sneaking documents out um, as yes. a military officer, and yes. somebody found out, and he knew that he had been discovered. So he arranged, um, you know, he arranged to leave, but made it clear that his, you know, to his family that they should say that he had been kidnapped. Yep, and, exactly. Um, so that they exactly. wouldn't take his family. Um, yeah, yeah, just horrible. It, nice. Yeah, 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 um, absolutely. Susan would like to know what is the fate of the archaeological sites. That's a terrific question. I mean, the, the, a, a tremendous amount has been destroyed. Um, uh, the, the, the world heritage destroyed. So, for example, parts of the of the ancient parts of the city of Aleppo, the um, souk, and so forth, have undergone tremendous damage. Um, a famous, famously, the you know ruins in in Palmyra were um, destroyed in part by ISIS. So ISIS had its own ideology of destroying um, what it saw as pagan or so forth. So some have been destroyed by ISIS and some have been have been um, destroyed in the course of the bombing. So um, there are you know, various archeological sites and heritage um, sites throughout the country, but a lot have sustained, have a lot of sustained terrible damage. So um, I wanna wrap up and just um, thank you. This has been fascinating and thank so you. interesting. We could talk about this for hours, I'm sure. Yep. Um, so for people here who are interested in helping, um, I know through certain religious communities, they've been mm -hmm. helping Syrian families mm -hmm. with, um, you know, apartments or furnishing apartments, finding um, jobs. Um, mm -hmm. Are there are there voices you trust that people here should be listening to or reading or, and organizations, if people want to get involved, what should they do? Right. Fantastic. I'm going to write some actually in chat now. So if, if anyone's interested in giving sort of charitable foundation or charitable donations, I'm going to write two. Can, can, can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Um, why don't you just send it to me because okay. I'll send it, a lot of people have left already. Okay, send wonderful. Me, I'll send it out to the whole group, even those who aren't here. Fantastic. I will. I will go ahead and do that. So there, there are such, such terrific organizations um, to which they're always looking for donations. So I've written two in chat. One is called the Karim Foundation. One is called the Mulham Volunteering Team. These are both two places that I um, I support with with donations. Uh, the Karim Foundation is actually Chicago based, doing incredible work um, with uh, education, supporting families in the United States and and many um, in the Middle East where their their situation is most dire. Uh, the Mulham team is a group of young Syrian refugees who were activists who fled the country and um, 
very much on the ground, uh, based in refugee communities, working with with refugees. So they do terrific work. But I'll be sure to send you send you more, uh, Wendy, as, as well. And there are um, there are uh, several dozen um, Syrian refugee families in the Chicago area. Some in Evanston, some in Skokie, some in Chicago. Um, and there are various uh, resettlement organizations uh, that you can get involved get involved locally as well. But some of these um, organizations I would really strongly support because they get to the people who are in the most dire, dire, dire of circumstances, um, who are typically those who are still uh, in Syria, inside Syria itself or on Syria's borders. Okay. Um, and if you could also include um, maybe some books or sources sure. that people who are interested in pursuing um, Susan asked, does your book have a reading list? It doesn't, um, no. but um, no, I, you are yeah. absolutely welcome to come back and talk to us when you are ready to discuss your next, your next follow-up book. Yeah, um, no, I would. I would love to know there's there's some it's wonderful books there's some fantastic websites that are continually putting out new content uh, new content. Um, and there have been some amazing documentary films as well, so for Sama is one I would highly recommend, but there are, are several several others so thank you for wanting to continue learning um, i'd be happy to, to to get you started on that journey. That would be great, and I will include the link for uh, for Sama wonderful. Mm -hmm in yeah. the follow-up um the dress that that uh -huh. director wore was absolutely stunning and, yeah um that's really powerful that she was able to communicate a message um you know to all the people without saying a word so yeah yeah i, um, I agree entirely um one last question yeah the, students from Syria who are here with expired visas or refugee status, are we forcing anyone to return home from our country? Um, I do not believe so. I mean, I myself have um, have given sort of expert affidavits at, at various asylum um, trials for Syrians who made it to the US on a tourist visa or on a student visa and are applying for asylum. So typically if you, um, if Syrians who are not, I mean, the Syrians who are resettled as refugees are, con are, are come and resettled as refugees, but there are other Syrians who might make it to Syria, make it to the US in one way or another. And um, as their own legal residencies expire or they want to turn to something more permanent, they have the right to apply for asylum. So um, um, at this point, I do not, there is the risk of, 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 asylum, of asylum application being denied. I don't, don't know, um, I currently haven't heard any cases of asylum uh, applications being, being denied, but the typical, if those students would like to stay, typically what they do then is apply for asylum. There, there's been a, a real backlog in um, asylum and immigration proceedings um, in the last years of, of the Trump administration. So a lot of those are being delayed. I know people who've had their, their papers pending for years now. So I imagine there's, a, there's an asylum process and it goes through the court system. So uh, to thank you for, for contacting your senators. I don't think there's a need to because I think that there, there's at this point um, uh, because there are legal, uh, there's a, a legal process in the U.S. that they're, they're, they would pursue. Right. Thank you, people. The book is wonderful. It's um, it's really heartfelt, and the the stories are so relatable. Um, the translation team that you worked with mm -hmm. did a masterful job. Um, it's all, you know, it's, they're people just like us and they've experienced unbelievable horrors. So thank you so much. Um, I thank hope you can okay. talk to us again. I'd be thrilled. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Everyone stay safe. Next Tuesday, we have Sheila Arnold, who will be doing a historical impersonation of the woman who was head of the NAACP, who led the fight um, to uh, integrate the schools in Arkansas. So don't miss it.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Levy Senior Center Foundation and uh, Wendy, Dr. Perlman, thank you again for your just fascinating uh, discussion. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Stop.